So you probably don't need the lab mic on. No, we want to hear you. That's great. That's great. There's two mics. Though. Okay. This one and this one. I don't care. If you want to, you can walk around on the stage. Jump around. <laughs> I did used to be a musician. I, I played many a show. So. Well, I'll get started. I was hoping more people would show up, but um, let's get going. Um, so, to, today I'm excited to talk to you guys about designing for integrated experiences across campus. I initially thought, and I prepared this talk to be in the higher education track, uh, but it is all about design, so it's fine that it's here, it's great that it's here. Uh, but you'll probably see a lot of higher end references uh, in this talk, so if that's not for you, feel free uh, to definitely get up and talk. But, uh, I'd like to kind of start by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, I uh, am a traveler. Uh, in fact, in 2014, I ditched all of my earthly belongings and sold all my stuff and traveled the country for the better part of the year uh, with my wife and my tiny little dog. And we had a blast. I am one that really feels like life is about experiences. So uh, if you have the opportunity to travel, uh, certainly do so. Um, I am also a designer um, and, a, and a senior web strategist at Modern Tribe, uh, where I get to help clients navigate really cool, unique projects uh, from start to finish. The majority of them on WordPress. Uh, and I get to tackle a lot of UX and design challenges every day. Uh, and a lot of them, like I said, for, for higher education institutions. So um, these lovely people are some of the some of the people that I get to work with at Modern Tribe. Uh, we're a team of 55 people, um, and we're actually distributed all across uh, the world. So uh, much like much like our clients are. So uh, I get the privilege of working with cool people all over, um, and it's it's really fun and unique and exciting. And one of the reasons why because we get to do stuff uh, like this. Uh, this is a video from, uh, from our Costa Rica uh, team trip this past year, and it was an amazing experience. Uh, I won't play the entire video because I think it's like 10 minutes long, but if you guys want to check it out, it's, uh, it's at Modern Tribe. Uh, TRI.BE is our URL. And uh, it's, it's really cool. The culture that we've created uh, at Modern Tribe is really centered around uh, people, uh, collaboration, being ha happy and helpful, and uh, and then we get to do cool stuff like this because everybody works in their own home offices, and uh, and it's pretty awesome. Uh, and here's a few of our clients, um, just uh, just a short smattering, if you will. But uh, you can see a lot of higher education uh, institutions on this list, and. I also uh, co-own and operate Press 25, which is a WordPress theme shop. Uh, we sell WordPress themes with plugins, and we get to do some cool stuff with that as well. So if you uh, if you feel like following us on Twitter or checking out the website, there you go. Uh, oh, and my Twitter handle is just Travis Potts. That's T R I T R A V I S T O T Z. Tater Tots with a Z. Uh, and I'm going to start with. Usually when I give a talk, uh, I kind of like to preface a few things. Uh, this is what I've learned uh, from doing this for 12 years and, and, and paths that I've taken. Um, and I think each designer, every person kind of needs to do their, their own thing. They need to be smart about their own decisions. And, and I think you're all passionate and driven people. Uh, and you'll probably have people that doubt you along the way. But uh, in general, those things are what grow us, I think, as designers. So, um, and then another preface, um, a lot of these lovely designer gifts and videos throughout my talk are from Gerbil, uh, or designspiration.net, or uh, a few random sites, uh, in addition to a couple that I've, I've created myself. So uh, I don't credit every individual artist. Uh, that would take a lot of time, but you'll find them. So let's reminisce, like, let's look back. Uh, because uh, one thing, uh, uh, first of all, I really like to use funny 90s gifts. Uh, and, and second of all, 
uh, I really like to initially set up a talk uh, that I'm doing based on what it's about. And this happens to be about higher education. And, and I like to reminisce about my own higher ed experience uh, as a designer, uh, emerging designer to call it, right? I, w I was a young and hungry design student. And I was super passionate about it. And I really was excited to go to design school. But I was terrible with the tools. And I think, uh, I think that is one thing that college really excelled at for me was, was teaching me and, and co-students how to, how to work with the tools. I mean, I was really bad, uh, even, even as, as a student. Uh, but I really thought I knew everything. Um, and I think a lot of people come from that uh, mentality, uh, even Young, specifically young people or young emerging designers, I think, suffer from that a little bit. But, uh, but in reality, I didn't really know much, much at all. Uh, and, and for me, it was a humbling, a really humbling experience uh, in college to realize that. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because college allowed me, and I think higher education in general, has the opportunity to allow people to really start observing good design and good design practice and, uh, and kind of seeing all that take shape. And the reason this is important is because it allows you to start seeing design systems. Um, and today's talk uh, about integrated uh, design experiences really comes from the basis of design systems, right? Um, because design is all about the moving pieces and everything that's involved in that, uh, in that experience. So I was in college over 12 years ago, which might not seem like that long ago, but for me it does. And, and I think from the design world, it probably does too, because design systems were certainly in practice, but they weren't really uh, a standard practice. You wouldn't walk across campus, I think, and see very consistent design, uh, maybe from building to building, or from experience to experience. Um, and, and, but, but you can still kind of see it taking shape. Um, and, and you might ask, possibly what a design system is. Well, a design system is, is really what allows us to create an integrated experience across campus, right? It, it, it's what drives every organization uh, to create consistency and cohesion in their brand. Um, it also allows better communication and user experiences through design. Um, and this is especially true within higher ed. Um, as a student, as a visitor, as a, as a donor, as an alumni, and any number of stakeholders, uh, to have a better experience with, with your brand. And oftentimes we, we kind of see design systems in the form online, at least in the form of brand guidelines or style guides. And as designers, I'm sure you know, we've seen many of these. This is the like Uber's example, uh, which is quite lovely. And what a guideline and a, and a style guide allow designers to do, or any team member, team member for that matter, is to have a source to pull from, to look at, and to reference when designing uh, something for you know, a client or an organization. So, uh, and, and kind of we start to see these really take shape in different forms too. I think now more than ever, I think we're seeing uh, more companies and organizations building off of the, the idea of a style guide. And this is from, uh, from MailChimp, which is actually less of a style guide, and they built out more of a voice and tone guide, which is which is great. I mean, they're taking the idea of a style guide and they're building it into something uh, that allows internal team members to speak about the brand, and as well as external uh, marketers and journalists to reference. Um, and we're actually seeing these examples become more readily available with higher education world as well. Um, taking this example from the University of Dayton, which is just a simple PDF, right? But the idea is uh, that they're telling people how to use their brand, their voice, um, and their design across different touch points and platforms uh, on campus. Um, and the practice, this practice is really becoming and growing uh, exponentially, uh, more than just a page with, with some logos to download and use on uh, on campus and off campus, but actually becoming more, uh, much more uh, 
not full fledged. So um, we also see design systems in use at conferences. So uh, you know, color palettes, logos, and different elements are carried across different mediums, and that's really your design system. Um, so this provides uh, really a, a great groundwork for what uh, what an integrated design experience is if, if done well. And it's what, again, drives that consistency uh, across brands. So uh, it's important to understand that creating seamless experiences across all channels is a, is a super complex undertaking for any organization. And I think that's even more true within higher education because uh, higher education has a lot of moving parts. They have many more stakeholders than I think is, is sort of standard within a normal organization or startup. Um, and I think many higher ed institutions have yet to fully realize uh, design systems and, and certainly integrated experiences across campus. Um, while they probably have been trying much longer than corporate America or startups, it's really hard to make headway at a higher ed institution, right? I mean, you're dealing with a lot more people and a lot more uh, kind of spread out design across any campus, especially. Um, so I think a lot of people might say, well, why does it really matter? And I think there's there's definitely a lot of reasons why it matters a lot to designers, but I think for, for other people it also matters quite a bit because it really is an impact on acquisition, uh, and that's acquisition of new, uh, new students, new faculty and staff, um, donor contributions, and, and really notoriety on a, on a national level or even international. Um, and it matters because a consistent, high-quality experience on campus um, and channel, channels and locations and touch points uh, can really help to, one, reduce cost um, by decreasing uh, kind of duplicated design work, two, to improve trust in your audience groups, um, and creating that consistency that I was saying uh, creates a seamless experience, right? And research is showing that users that are given a consistent experience uh, really gravitate towards uh, towards those institutions or those organizations or those startups that provide that for them. Um, and three, it can definitely increase growth and, and those acquisitions that I was talking about. I think um, that's super important in higher ed. I think we're seeing that shift in higher education where, um, where students maybe aren't, or, or potential students aren't really seeing the value right away of higher education. And I think shift that focus, we have to create some of this brand consistency and certainly uh, knowledge for those potential students uh, to really observe. And I think with the growth, uh, with increased growth, you know, you really are able to do that. And obviously, design systems can certainly help with that. Um, so let's take it to another level. Let's take it to the higher education level, uh, right? So at the higher ed level, um, it, it really becomes more than just, you know, throwing a logo on something. It's really wherever the brand is being used across campus. So, and that's print, web, uh, mobile apps, mobile platforms, and so forth. It's, it's certainly not just throwing something together. Uh, and it, like I said, it's really distributed across, uh, across the campus. Um, and it can really be tricky to navigate, right? I think for designers, we always, uh, we're really excited about using new uh, design inspiration to create new communication methods or new communication tools through design. And that is, is really tricky within higher education um, because there's so much to think about. Um, and it's, it's I threw this up here just because I love this gift, yeah, but, uh, but it's, it's, it can definitely be tricky. I know for me as a designer and a strategist of Modern Tribe, often we work with higher education institutions and often um, I find myself spending you know, a few evenings before working with any of these institutions on really trying to understand their brand and doing a lot of research and trying to you know, look at what campus actually looks like and feels like. And we actually have quite a few uh, clients here in Boston, which is actually pretty funny, but I've never been here now I'm here, which is super fun. I can walk through the Harvard campus, and Harvard's one of our clients. So 
uh, that's really exciting. But even before that, and it's in interesting as a distributed agency to try to do that research, but it's tricky because, uh, all of those reasons, but also because there's many years of, of legacy within any higher ed institution, or most higher ed institutions, right? Um, you know, there's hundreds of faculty and staff, generally thousands of students, and, and more often than not, it's from different stakeholders, which I think is the tough part uh, in designing for higher ed. So, really, how many are we talking here? So this is just, a sh I think this is probably a short list. It's just one that I tried to throw together uh, to give you an idea, but, but it's really dependent from organization to organization, right? Um, but even on this, you're talking about different departments, you're talking about marketing and communications, which, which is kind of generally the stakeholder. Um, and one I did throw up here is IT, which is, which is also really important as a stakeholder for, uh, for higher education because you're dealing with what the platform is that they're on and any issues with IT infrastructure on campus. Um, students, of course, both prospective and current, um, alumni, donors, even the community around campus. And then you're also dealing with a lot of different platforms and touch points. Um, this is more often uh, much larger than a standard project, right? You're dealing with how the brand looks across all of these things. And of course, you will not generally be the only designer working on it, uh, but to think about all these things, I think, is the thing to remember as, as a designer designing for higher ed. And that's a lot. That's a lot of, of stakeholders and people involved, and it's, it's a lot of different touch points and avenues for uh, de potential design failure or breakdown of that consistency. Um, so I think that uh, to, to design at the higher level, it's really trying to think about that entire ecosystem. And that ecosystem is all of those things I talked about, or all those kind of that list that I just showed you guys, all those stakeholders and all of those uh, all those different platforms and touch points. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're only responsible for one, right? If you're only responsible for the website redesign, you still need to think about that integrated experience across more than just the website. Um, because you don't want your website, and I'll show you guys some examples later on, to just feel uh, like an external piece of that organization. So how do you consider the entire ecosystem? And that sounds really hard, right? Well, it is hard, and, and I think it's tough. But uh, hopefully by the end of the talk, you guys will at least have some ideas of how we do it as an organization. Um, I want to try to uh, maintain consistency as well. And how do you make future visual changes faster and more efficient? And here are some things that, that I've learned. So you must use a single source of truth. SSOT is the term. Um, it sounds like something out of the Matrix, and here I am using an Indiana Jones game. But <laughs> the idea is that you should have that sacred source, uh, that golden idol. Um, does anybody know? I, I looked at stuff just because I was like, what's that idol called? I don't even know what they, if they name it, but it's called the touch plate fertility idol. I don't know. It doesn't matter. But anyways, so that's the single. That's the idea of a single source of truth. And again, here's the official definition for you guys, but for me, um, the, the idea of using a single source of truth is the practice of structuring information. Um, so whether that be design systems or guidelines or style guides, uh, so that everything across an entire platform uh, or, or usage system uh, is in one place or stored in one location, a single source of truth, and it's always referenced in that single spot. Uh, what? what? So that means all of the designs, all the assets, all the UI elements are stored in a repository or a folder or some location and updated in that central location for all the use. Something changes, it gets updated in that one location. Um, and of course, this might not be like hyper realistic for some organizations or maybe even a lot of organizations, but in higher ed, it's super important. Um, and that idea of maintaining that style guide. Uh, becomes even more important to creating uh, a consistent experience uh, and an integrated experience across campus. 
So uh, just to give me some ideas, of course, some of these ideas are very uh, standard for us designers, but how to roll them out across you know, a huge organization is the tough part, right? So many organizations do this by using a uh, central storage location on campus, so a server location or a folder with design assets. We've done that for different clients where uh, you know, we'll generally VPN into a server on campus to update assets, and then they use those assets across campus. Um, Dropbox folders work great. Not everybody's on Dropbox, so there's some issues there. Uh, Google Drive, the same idea. Uh, and then Amazon storage is, is certainly pretty, pretty powerful as well as used widely. Uh, but it's tough uh, to have those things uh, be used consistently when people are using those design assets anywhere on campus. So that's even your, you know, your second year design student that's putting together a poster or banner for an event at the student center, right? But if they're able to know where all those things are, um, that's where it really becomes powerful. Um, and I want to throw something out here, and designer would probably like, what? Uh, but it's possible, I think, for design teams to even use Git. And how many people are familiar with Git? So Git, for anybody that's not, is, is a version control uh, or a visioning system. Uh, that's often used by dev teams uh, to manage and maintain code across projects, right? It's what allows them to work on a branch and then check in a branch and then have things uh, be versioned if there's any issues, they can roll back and so forth. And designers, we don't really think of it as a, as a tool that we can consistently use, but I've seen, I've seen some organizations use Git for design quite well, right? Because Git isn't great necessarily for tracking changes in binary files or image files, right? But the real power comes into play with the ability to check things out or roll back to previous files and designers can notate things. And this can be a really neat tool if you're working at a large organization and you have a project or task that the school has somehow forgotten about over time or something. Um, and a new team, or even yourself, uh, can up or someone left off with notes um, and, and very little to no onboarding time uh, or file management time because it's already been done and you kind of hit the ground running. So uh, it sounds weird for design, but I've seen it work quite well uh, even with higher ed. Uh, but any of these tools, Git, uh, you know, server storage, folder structures, it's really about maximizing efficiency of a team and laying the groundwork for, uh, for better design. Across, across the team, right? Um, and to store documents in one location, and in other words, using that single source of truth. Um, and again, as designers, we can use this same principle uh, on how to, to keep stay relevant, uh, keep consistency across design systems, and, and hopefully grow and evolve an organization. Um, so, how do we start in designing for an integrated experience? And, and some of this is pretty high level, so take notes or let me know if you have questions afterwards. Uh, I just want to go pretty high level because I want to go through examples as well. And uh, but each project, uh, just just so we like lay the groundwork. Each project is unique, and getting started on any project is unique to that project. So I think as designers, you must tackle your project in that way. Uh, and the best way that works for you and for the task that you, that you have uh, laid out in front of you. But that being said, let's review some unique considerations uh, that you should really think about when tackling design at a uh, higher ed level or in a, a large organization um, where you're really thinking about, uh, about an integrated design system. So starting by meeting with your stakeholders and understanding the project goals and the requirements. Um, and I actually did a talk for called Defining a Clear Path for Design at WordCamp Minneapolis this year uh, that kind of goes through an entire design process um, that, that I don't want to do that again here today, but if you if you want to hit me up for the slides later, I think it might be on WordCamp TV or as well, but happy to share that knowledge with you guys too. Um, but you need to also establish your work um, and understand that client or institution, right? Um, 
the right questions. So figure out uh, the details regarding what you'll be designing uh, by asking the right questions, uh, like where will this be used, where will it be displayed, uh, or shown, who's going to be using it. Uh, for example, if an audience of, of mobile users are, are prospective students, what you design is definitely going to be different than designing a donor form aimed at older alumni of the organization, right? So those are the type of things, by asking the right questions on where that design is going to be used and who the audience is, really comes into play. And then also, it also brings to light accessibility considerations, which is huge at the higher end level. Asking the right questions also brings to light accessibility considerations. Because designing across campus is super important to be accessible. You're dealing with a lot of different uh, potential issues with uh, who is going to be using or viewing the design um, and allowing it to be more accessible for those users. So there's some things to think about when it comes to accessibility. And these are just three top high level things. Uh, but in general, to abide by the rule that contrast uh, is, is key to readability. So keeping things at least viewable, especially if it's important information, um, with contrast between elements. Um, and don't necessarily rely on color to, uh, to convey your information. What that means is <clears throat> if you have a call to action or a button or something like that, um, make sure that color isn't necessarily what you're determining uh, that or, or why that should be important. So think about contrast before you actually think about color, right? So if a button is on uh, a dark background or something like that, it's hard for that to be accessible for some people. Um, really mainly because color blindness obviously affects 10% uh, of the world's population, which is, which is pretty huge when you think about uh, who will be attending uh, and, and your audience at the higher end level. Um, and then three, think about those fancy things and like think about the coolest thing you can do and the, the most awesome jobs for animations you can, you can implement and then dive in. Because a lot of those things have issues with accessibility um, and it can be definitely a concern. So, uh, for instance, it's embarrassing to say this, but even the Modern Tribe website relies on some fancy JavaScript. Uh, because we took that upon ourselves to uh, decouple WordPress uh, using WP API, and we built the website on React. Um, and it's fully JavaScript. So right now, if you go to the Modern Tribe website and you don't, uh, you don't have JavaScript, you're not going to really see the same experience, uh, which is fine to a point. But we didn't launch it that way. We had to roll that in, right? So those things are things to think about. The fancy stuff uh, from an accessibility standpoint can be tough. Um, and next, it's, it's also really important to plan your roadmap. Know what you're roughly doing and when you're roughly doing it. Um, this allows uh, quicker communication uh, along the project plan. Um, it allows uh, you to manage stakeholder expectations. Um, it allows you to generate a shared understanding across uh, every team that's involved. And it allows you to communicate plans with other important teams or organizations. Um, do some user research. So after you've figured everything out, you've, you've met with a stakeholder, you understand what you're doing, um, do your user research. Uh, even if it's only a little bit, because what's it's really important as, as a designer to think about the user's goals and what they are. Um, and if you have no idea what Completing an informed design is, is really impossible. Remember also that user experience precedes uh, UI, so your visual design, right? Your UX design should inform your UI. You've sat with your user research and hopefully you understand who you'll be designing for. Um, and the better experience you create for those users, the happier they will be. And the opposite is also true, right? So the worse or the, uh, the, the lesser the experience, by those users um, or patrons, uh, the more they will become frustrated with what, you, what you've what you designed and what you're providing. Um, and they will be far less likely to use the service, uh, sign up for uh, registration, uh, admission, and so forth, especially at the higher end level. Um, and it's, it's 
important. Your goal with figuring out the user experience should be to help identify the most important tasks for the user. So remember that in order to create an effective user experience, you need to make sure um, that it helps users identify the information and seek it out with too much hassle, without too much hassle. Um, and also have a clear vision uh, to align your efforts. If you know what you'll be designing and who will be using it, you figure that out based on your user research. Uh, and what the goals are, you can align those efforts and create something more effective. Um, and this is certainly important uh, with so many stakeholders involved. Design for consideration. So sticking, over sticking to a design pattern necessarily, uh, use your style guide or your design system and work from that. Um, and test and then decide, right? So don't just copy everything that's been done before, especially at the higher ed level. Of course, be cognizant of uh, what the brand is and what it is what it looks like. Um, but the unique thing about, about designing for an integrated experience is making those choices that directly impact the user in their path. So don't just choose to use a hamburger menu or a mobile menu because it's what's being used elsewhere. Uh, test and then decide. So test based on your knowledge of the project and then decide what you're designing. Um, and also design for the funnel and what that means uh, and how it applies to uh, user uh, user interface and, and the visual design that you'll be designing is that any other medium that you're carrying your design through, for example, uh, you need to build your desired interaction or your action, uh, rather, around that process. So if the process is to lead users to submit an application form uh, to the school, make sure that your design supports them. So that's the fun. That's the idea of the fun. Uh, where you need to be. Remember to conserve uh, attention. Uh, and what I mean by that is, um, if I wanted you guys to look up at the screen, this is attention grabbing, right? So um, remember to conserve that attention. So when you're designing, don't be too flashy. Um, and the idea is not to create things that are super, uh, super flashy, but to use the flash and use uh, the attention grabbing stuff when you need to. Um, and part of your process should be to Bring designers, um, and departments, managers, marketing teams, and stakeholders around uh, together around one single goal. Um, I want to get to examples, and I have not a ton of time left, so I'm going to go quick through these these last slides. But drive your design decisions by guiding those people. Uh, guide them by design and design experience, and make sure that that design experience is based around an inter integrated experience. So here's some examples of integrated experiences. Um, and I, I start this with a few bad examples um, so that we can see when they fall apart and how they fall apart. And I hate to pick on any university, so forgive me. But I wanted to throw out at least a few examples. And here's Caltech's website, old website, uh, mind you. They've, they've updated it, but it works really well for this example um, because, uh, because they've worked hard on, on actually integrating a new design experience and integrated experience. But this is the best example I can think of. So that's their website. Um, and these were taken around the same time, too. Um, and this is the Children's Center at Caltech. Um, again, so we're dealing with not a lot of consistency. Um, and we see it again here on their business cards, which are awesome, with a neat little uh, die cut. But they're still not using a consistent logo across any of these mediums. And again, somewhat of a bad example, but a yearbook as well. Uh, which isn't that weird from a higher ed? I know they did the yearbooks. Maybe not. Um, but here's an example that really actually on the other end of the spectrum does, does it quite well. At Yale, they've done a pretty dang good job of carrying across their brand and design system through their platform and touch points. Um, and you can see it because that was the main Yale uh, website, and this is the law website. While they're using a few unique fonts uh, here and there, you're seeing the same consistency in uh, general font styling, uh, color palette, usage, um, and even some of the same design patterns. Another piece from Yale. Um, athletics, which is generally pretty different and can be pretty different from a campus experience. But at Yale, you kind of see some consistency 
um, even within you know, locker rooms or something like that, um, versus what you see as a patron or a visitor walking through uh, the entrance to the location. But within the organization, uh, I stumbled upon this. I didn't even know it existed. Uh, but I stumbled upon this when I was looking for worst higher ed websites. Uh, this is actually, believe it or not, the Yale Design uh, Center's website. Which is actually pretty funny. But, and I don't mean to say anything, I think they're trying to be pretty artsy, uh, which is my guess. But I think the lesson here is that it's normal for out out outliers to occur. In fact, it happens quite, quite often. Even as much as you try to police the system, it happens no matter what you do. So it's important to know that uh, as, as the stakeholder, if you're a stakeholder, to know that those things will happen and how to handle them when they do happen. But pretty crazy. The design, uh, the designers at Yale are going crazy. Um, and, uh, and this is actually an example that, that we created at Modern Tribe for Harvard, uh, for, for the law school specifically. Um, but often, with most projects, what we're designing, um, what we're designing around is how to create a UI kit and a style guide for the brand to be used on the website, and then we, sh we sh save and share these elements with the school so that they can use them elsewhere, right? So this is something that we built uh, for use on the law school site. Um, here, here it is in practice. kind of see some of the elements used across the site. But you can see consistency of those elements. Um, and then Harvard was, was then able to take that system, to take that UI kit uh, and style guide and use it elsewhere, uh, which is pretty neat. Uh, this is a subsite of Harvard Law, uh, a new site. So uh, of course we have a few unique fonts, which is generally something that happens within any organization. But they're still able to use those elements and start from them and customize them, which we also often help our, help our clients do. Um, Stanford Law School as well. Um, we did something very similar with the UI kit. I couldn't find it before, uh, before I put all the slides together. But you can still see a lot of consistency uh, within the law school and even within the subsites or secondary areas and pages on this site. For example, is, is certainly unique, um, but we're using a consistent header. We're able to <coughs> use the same font style and stack. And this is a completely different site, site subsite at Stanford. Um, and we're able to use a lot of the same elements and the same design systems and experience, but having it split across different properties or different websites uh, at Stanford is pretty normal for most projects. Uh, so again, you might see somewhat unique font staff, uh, but we're still using the same colors and elements. And those are just a few examples. Um, so thanks, guys, <clears throat> as I get some water. But I would love to answer questions with the last, how much time do I have left, guys? 10 minutes? Oh, four minutes. Just because the next speaker needs to start at 10.50. Oh, cool. Um, so I think 10 minutes it would be 10 50 or 9 minutes. Okay. Cool. Well, let's just go with questions and then see what, uh, see what we can get done. Do you guys have any questions? Or maybe you don't. I would love to answer some. Yeah. Just quickly, um, how do you balance showing a client ideas versus pulling uh, requirements out of them or um, you know, doing a Q&A analysis of what they want versus, you know, a lot of clients are like, just show me some stuff. You know, and, and we all hate that, but it's like, you know, how do you balance that yeah. kind of uh, give and take? That's a, that's a great question. So a lot of the time for us at Modern Tribe is uh, actually building out some of those uh, some of those elements beforehand, like you saw with the Stanford example, where we actually build out things like this to get buy-in, to get font style and stack uh, established, especially on a subsite like this. Um, and then we take that and we can roll it out. And we generally get approval on something like this or at the same time as a design concept uh, before we kick it into high gear and finish the rest of the design. So let's show something like this to them? Yeah. Like up front. Yeah, so we use Envision 
uh, the map for showing uh, not only design elements and systems like this, but also to, to show design comps. And often our design process and review process is to share a board with them. That we walk through those elements and we do that generally by showing uh, individual elements um, and then we go through and then we'll nail down to the actual mock-up of a full page. Any other questions? Yes? Do you, um, at Modern Tribe, use um, design thinking in the early stages of the process? Yeah, our process is very aligned with the idea that design strategy should be before much else, right? So um, establishing uh, something that's super important, obviously, on every project is, is information architecture and content architecture, which is something that we drive uh, by design. Right? So we try to think about content architecture and how it aligns to design. So we know that we have X amount of content and this is where that content gets to live. Um, and then that will drive how we figure out uh, it needs to be designed and it needs to be built. In that same field, in that same process, at what point do you involve the client in the design thinking process? Um, our clients are involved from the very beginning. So we do weekly, uh, weekly standing meetings with every client that we work with. Um, and that weekly scrum is anywhere between 15 minutes to an hour. Updates, it's questions, it's uh, Q&A sessions, a lot of how do we work on this project together as a team, much more than us just showing something to the client and we rely on. Uh, it's more of a collaborative process for sure. Anything else? You guys are all walking in. Well, hit me up. If you guys do have questions, I would love to answer them. Um, again, I'm at uh, Travis Tots on Twitter. Uh, feel free to hit me up, or um, I'll be around.